All right, welcome to Hillbrook School's first Center for Teaching Excellence webinar. I'm Amy Giles, the Director of Teaching and Learning at Hillbrook. We're excited that you're joining us for today's conversation about teaching and learning. Today's topic is designing classrooms as teaching tools. We're excited to be joined by Signo Udenberg, the manager of the Innovation Studio at the design firm MK Think in San Francisco. Signo will share his thoughts about how space impacts human behavior and how schools are approaching the redesign of classrooms and other learning spaces. Hillbrook teachers will then share specific changes they have made to their classrooms and how those changes have impacted the student learning experience. So we've planned a 30-minute presentation and we invite you to share your comments and questions in the text box alongside the video. At 3.45, we'll start answering questions from the audience. This webinar will be available at the same Google Plus link when we're done, and also at hillbrookcte.org. Yeah, well. So I'm going to let each person introduce themselves now, starting with Ilsa and ending with Signo. Hi, I'm Ilsa Doman. I'm a sixth grade science teacher and the CTE research designer here at Hillbrook. Hello, I'm Bill Selleck. I'm our director of technology. I'll also be running the Q&A at the end. Hi, I'm Laura Hansen, and I teach seventh and eighth grade English with Julia Rubin, who also teaches seventh and eighth grade English. I'm Susanna Long, and I teach third grade. Hi. I'm Josie Ann Kelly, and I teach 4th through 8th grade Spanish. All right, Signo. And I'm Signo Enberg. I'm the manager of uh, the Innovation Studio at MK Think. All right, is this my cue to take it away? It is. Yes. All right, here we go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and throw a full screen. All right, and can you see me? Yep. Can you see the slides? Mm -hmm. Perfect. OK, just uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So design to learn and improve. And Bill, can you tell me real quick, you guys can hear me? Yes. yes. Sounds right, awesome. Perfect. I can't see the screen anymore. Perfect. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so how creativity can dovetail with science. Um, so again, Amy, thank you for the intro. Uh, my name is Signo Unberg. I lead the experience and design uh, teams uh, through the innovation studio at MK Think, uh, design consulting firm based in San Francisco. Uh, we've worked with schools large and small, with, uh, kind of kids big and small across the country, uh, and many very close to home, including Hillbrook, uh, Town School for Boys, Alt School, and uh, Stanford University. Uh, for the past couple years, we've been working with Hillbrook to explore uh, the designs of intentional, kind of agile learning environments, uh, both at the campus scale uh, as well as the building and classroom scales. Um, so what are agile learning environments and why do we care about them? Um, just to kind of go back in time and not to go too far back, but uh, you know, bringing up why we even have uh, uh, environments or spaces in the first place. And part of that has to do with the variability of outside conditions, right? So we built initial structures just to protect us from the wind and the rain um, so that we could eat, sleep, and do our other activities uh, without being affected by that uh, variability. Uh, but over the years, we've kind of become obsessive about controlling space and making it uh, you know, so controlled that we actually don't leverage uh, the natural environment very much. We don't really pay attention to what it's doing to um, the human being and what it's doing to the person. Uh, we get locked up in building systems and thinking about all the, you know, the engineering and architectural design, but we forget how it affects the people that are in them. Um, and we go so far as to recreate the environment completely uh, and actually lose a lot of what makes them unique. And, and what's worse is we're actually finding that many of these environments are holding us back. Um, and we actually know how great environments can affect us, right? We've all been outside. We've all felt the joy of sunshine hitting our faces and how that uh, you know, creates a warmth that then kind of, uh, you know, affects the way that we perceive the day. And we smell, uh, you know, roses or other uh, flowers when it's spring, and we know how that affects us through our olfactory senses. So we know the environment affects us, and, and we want to pay attention to how it's affecting us, uh, you know, physiologically, but also psychologically and through our cognitive abilities. Um, here's a study, and hopefully you can take a quick look at this. Uh, we were working with the 
you know, we work with schools and then we work with uh, the Marines. So it's an interesting life being both in Hawaii and the Philippines and then out here sitting in schools uh, from K through 8. Um, but this was a study we did with the Marines where we were looking at their facilities uh, in a forward operating base in the Philippines. Uh, and while we were trying to study energy usage, we were also looking at other uh, variables inside uh, their tents. And one of the things that we noticed, which is in this blue line that you see here, is elevated CO2 levels. Um, and what's interesting is they've done lots of studies that show as soon as you start having elevated CO2 levels in the interior environment, cognitive ability drops off. Um, so in one sense, they were designing to create this cool, controlled environment um, but in doing so, so many people stacked into the tents uh, that the CO2 levels went up. And uh, it would be funny if it wasn't that the, uh, for the fact that this group uh, was the quick response medical team that's responsible for, uh, you know, saving lives. And so do you want those people sitting in a room that is actually uh, worsening their cognitive ability and their ability to respond? Um, so the role of the researcher is changing, the role of the designer is changing and how we design spaces and buildings. And part of that has to do with measurement. Um, our teams uh, have started to act more as researchers, experimenters, and strategists um, to start understanding how space affects us and how we can actually tie uh, variables related to the environment, uh, variables related to human behavior and patterns um, to performance uh, of core activities like learning or working um, you know, cooking, loving, whatever those activities are, how do we tie these variables back to performance? Um, we take this information and we start to analyze it and we try to use this basis of, uh, of data as a, as a platform for creativity. What is actually happening? What are we predicting is going to happen? Um, and how do we learn from it and get smarter about the environments we are creating? Um, we're in an age where we can start using sensors, both environmental sensors, but also uh, sensors that we can put on humans, you know, we use uh, Fitbits, we use uh, other devices that measure our stress levels, um, our perspiration, etc. We're starting to use these in spaces so that we can understand how the physical environment is affecting um, our abilities to get our work done. In schools we talk about environment as a teaching tool. The main thing that's happening at schools is generally uh, someone's learning something, someone's teaching something, um, and the building and the environment supports that. Uh, or could support that, and we want to know how. And we break it into two areas, in direct uh, and indirect. Indirect is everything that kind of supports the, the, the teachers teaching students, you know, making the environment um, easily adaptable and responsive to the things that they want to be able to teach. And direct is uh, designing the building so that it is intentionally a tool that a student can engage directly and learn something, whether that's through the environment interacting with physical space, um, or in some other way where the building itself can teach. Um, and this is where we start getting into a very interesting area of intentionality in space design. Um, and you can start to see what some of these spaces look like. They, in these cases, many of these are indirect uh, teaching tools, but they allow students to move around. You know, you start to see a lot of things that are modular, and this kind of fits into this idea of agile learning environments, flexible, responsive, able to be customized uh, to student needs, allow them to move around and, and optimize their own learning experience, uh, as well as to be taught how to, uh, how to learn in the first place. Um, so you can start to see how some of these environments uh, take on um, kind of a different look. It's a creative look, but it's responsive to students' and teachers' needs. Uh, and you can really end up with some uh, amazing spaces. So this is all kind of great and it's exciting, um, but how do you get there and how do you start? And part of it is starting with simple moves that invite intentionality into the design space. Um, I, today, you're going to hear from some of the teachers who have taken these first steps towards changing their spaces um, to invite intentionality in the space. And one of the first things to do is to take a space and just ask some questions. What's happening and what's measurable? How often are things being used? How are they being moved around? And we use these as proxies to understand are the things that we're designing and putting in the space even being used in the first place? And then we start to tie it to, okay, so it's being used X amount of time or in X number of ways, and what is the performance on tests? What's the performance on engagement or other metrics that you might use for learning? So this is kind of the future of space design and intentionality, uh, you know, both broadly but then within learning. 
um, to use data, to use analysis, uh, to, to lever up creative designs, and to be able to iterate to get to uh, environments that are going to be better for uh, current and future learners. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Signo, so much for that perspective. Um, working with your team has really helped us clarify our own thinking and our own questions um, and pushed us to be better about measuring um, the results of our intentions when we go in and design those spaces. Uh, I'm Elsa Doman. Again, I'm the sixth grade science teacher at Hobart School and also the CTE research designer. Um, as the school's research designer this year, I've been focusing most of my time on helping teachers redesign their classrooms um, and also follow up on those redesigns to see what's working and what isn't or identify what are the impacts of the physical changes on students. Redesigning classrooms at Hobart began about five years ago with our iLab, which was this totally agile, content agnostic space. Um, and teachers booked it like a library, brought to do the lessons that they couldn't do very easily in their own classrooms. And this uh, two-year-long experimental use of a learning space that didn't belong to anyone in particular helped us really isolate what were some of the key features of a classroom that really invited student engagement um, and brought students to be co-creators of their learning and of their learning environment. In the last two years, I've been helping teachers design <coughs> Excuse me. I've been helping teachers who are now self-selecting into the redesign process um, think about their own classroom spaces, starting with the kinds of learning and behaviors that they want to promote in their environment, um, and then asking them to think about the themes that we isolated during this iLab study, um, which we're going to talk more about, but those themes are, are movement, choice, ownership, and inclusion. And then I'm helping teachers plan research studies to go back and look at, once they've made those changes, how are they really impacting students. Um, and their learning. Today we're going to hear uh, four stories of spaces that have been redesigned at Hillbrook, and it happens that each of these touches on one of those four themes, movement, choice, ownership, and inclusion. Some of these teachers are in their first year of redesign, others have been doing it for three or four years, some have overhauled their entire classroom, others are working with just a particular area of the classroom, and some of them are going to share um, quantitative approaches that we've taken to measuring the outcomes. Others are going to share more qualitative evidence. In each case, I hope that we leave you with the impression that classroom space matters, uh, that a simple change to the classroom can affect students um, immediately, their experience and their learning, and that following up on those changes can reveal amazing depths to the relationship between the classroom and student learning. Two of our second grade teachers, Taylor Hovish and Sarah Lee, couldn't be here today, um, so I'm going to share their story, which is mostly about movement. In second grade this year, the teachers brought in new seating options, which included beanbag chairs, two types of still stools, and one wiggle stool, which has a concave bottom and allows students to pivot around while they're sitting. The teachers observed a really strong reaction in the students to these stool choices and the variety that was in the classroom. And they found that the new wiggle stools were more popular than they were expecting, and there were a lot of students who wanted to use them all the time. The second gram team noticed that the wiggle stools seemed to be helping a lot of students focus when they had to sit for periods of time at a table doing an activity like um, practicing math or spelling skills. So in December, they came to me and, and asked them to help them design a study to see were the wiggle stools actually impacting students' ability to do their work in a measurable way. So we designed a study to compare the students' work in these two types of stools. And we had all the second graders working on a mental math worksheet for five minutes, trying to complete as many problems as correctly, or correctly as they could in that sitting. And each student was measured twice, about one week apart, once doing the worksheet um, in a still stool, like the one pictured here on the left, and then once doing the, a very similar worksheet um, in a wiggle stool, like the one pictured on the right. And what we found was that when students sat in wiggle stools, they completed statistically significantly more problems in five minutes than when they sat in the still stools. So this was really exciting because we saw that a teacher observation of this kind of increased student focus was actually resulting in a measurable difference in work output and in such a short period of time. And so we've been following up. This has opened up a lot of new questions for us that we're now trying to explore. For example, do the wiggle stools work best um, for some kinds of thinking but not others? For example, with um, generative or creative thinking but not with memorization and recall. Does it matter um, or does age matter when it comes um, to students reliably choosing their own best chair option? Um, great. Uh, next up. 
we're going to hear from Susanna Long, who's our third grade teacher, and she's going to be talking to us about changes that she's made in her classroom on the theme of classroom ownership. Hi, so I'm Susanna Long, and I've been at Hillbrook School teaching third grade for 15 years. And for the first 13 years, I was alone in the classroom um, teaching on my own, and I had a rather imposing teacher desk. Um, it's the kind where the front goes all the way down to the floor, and um, and I it, sort of I could see the classroom, but I had sort of a an enclave in the one corner of the room um, with my file cabinets on one side, and there was also even another um, sort of cupboard. So I really had sort of a it was very divided, me and the students. And I think what tended to happen was I think students came up to this big huge desk um, and it, it didn't seem as though it was sort of a neat place to come to. It was either some place you'd go to correct work or sit with me. Um, anyway, that's my old desk. And um, then we got resident teachers in um, two years ago. And the first year, I had no idea what I was doing with a resident. And so the person, the resident teacher didn't have her own desk, and she was working at the kidney table. Um, then we were asked to get two, for this year, to get two smaller tables um, that were the same size for me and the resident teacher. So it was co-teaching. There was no sort of hierarchy. And so this year, Matt and I have two very slim um, tables. They don't really even have the bottom part that's imposing, and they're not much larger than the student desks. And what's neat is that they're up against the wall. So really, they're just other furniture, but um, it's, it's not imposing, and it's um, more, it's less divided. It's just part of the room. Kids walk by all the time. They get a pencil. They get a post-it. There are supplies on those desks. And if you're coming to work with either teacher, you can sit in the other spinny chair, teacher chair. So there's not as much of a division or a sense of hierarchy in the room. So even though it started as just a furniture change, um, it seems as though the impact is less of a hierarchy in the room. Awesome. Thanks, Susanna. Sure. Next up, we're going to hear from Josie Ann Kelly, and she'll be speaking a little bit about student choice. Hi, Elsa. I'm Josie Ann Kelly, and I teach fourth through eighth grade Spanish. I've been teaching here at Hillbrook for 16 years now. And my story is that for the last couple of years, or actually for quite a few years, my classroom had huge, heavy tables, about 10 or 11 of them, um, hard plastic bucket chairs, and a very small whiteboard. So there was not a lot of uh, mobility, ways to move the, the tables. They were just heavy, and to move them really didn't give us a lot of space. So we didn't have a lot of options. So that really didn't motivate me to uh, change my curriculum up because it just wasn't much to do. Um, so the setup of the room was very static. So then this year they said, oh, did you want to look into changing your classroom? And I thought, aha. So this could be an opportunity for me to not only change the classroom, but also re-energize my sense of teaching and, and recharge my batteries, which were kind of getting a little low there. Um, so I got, um, as you can see here, new flip-top smaller whiteboard tables. I have the same amount, but they're smaller. Um, I changed my seating from big bucket blue chairs to now chairs where there's more options as far as the way the students can sit, so they can sit kind of um, sideways, they can sit uh, any way they'd like in, in any comfort, and there's even a way to kind of bend yourself, you know, push it back a little bit. So there's, they're definitely much more comfortable. Um, I also got a ripple chair, as you can see in the back there, so that's an option. Five um, huge bean bags, <laughs> which you can see there in the back as well. I have whiteboards now across the, from almost floor to ceiling, from a on the back wall there that you can see there too, so no more small white one. Um, and I also have, um, what was I going to say? Oh, um, forgetting now. Oh, uh, lighting. I have much better lighting now as well. So it's a, kind of a more of a full spectrum. So I was given that carte blanche, and this is what I did. And my batteries have been, I can say, recharged. 
Um, it's given the kids more options. I'm giving the kids more options, so I'm being more flexible in my planning. Um, I've given the kids the choice to sit where they want during tests, and they seem to be enjoying that. Um, some have chosen to sit in bean bags. Some have chosen to sit in the ripple chair. Some still choose the desk. But I think with that choice, it's made them more comfortable. Um, anytime you go into a test situation, kids are, you know, already that's anxiety. So I think with this choice, um, kids can relax a little bit more. So that's what I've been noticing. Just options have provided a lot more comfort and, um, yeah, ease in the classroom. Thank you. Thanks, Josiane. Um, we're now going to hear from Laura Hansen and Julia Rubin, who teach 7th and 8th grade English here at Hillbrook. And they'll be talking a little bit about um, the changes they've made to their classroom in the last few years and how these have um, brought more student ideas to the surface and included more student ideas in the lessons and discussions. Yeah, so I'm Julia Rubin, uh, teaching. I've been here at Hillbrook School for four years. Um, and for the past two years, have been teaching with Laura Hansen. Me, and this is my second year. I'm a resident teacher at Hillbrook. And um, two years ago was when we started making changes to the 7th 8th English classroom. Um, just to like provide a little background, the English classroom previous to these changes had um, tables not that didn't have a writable surface, um, not on wheels, and the whiteboard space was really limited. Um, and we do still have a smart board, um, but the smart board was more of a main feature of the room as a way to like share the space. And of course, this um, designated the front of the room wherever the smart, the, the smart board was. Uh, um, and so one of the things that we wanted to do as we were looking for building greater inclusion um, was to cultivate a culture of collaboration in the room. Um, thinking that if we could really get our kids going collaboratively with language, that that would implicitly involve them being more inclusive of each other. Um, so the physical changes that manifested from, from those decisions were to have a, a huge whiteboard wall in the back, um, which reoriented where the front of the room could be, which seemed really um, a cool thing to, to work on. We got writable services on the desks. The desks were on wheels. Two more whiteboards in the front of the room. And um, we also got a bunch of pillows for like our window seat on the side and a couch, uh, which it's amazing what a couch can do in a classroom. <laughs> uh, I would say that is like the number one uh, culture changing element, probably the couch. Um, well, you guys have norms and everything, right? <laughs> we have to have norms for the couch. We have lots yeah. of space norms. Oh, sure. It's like three kids can be on the couch, but then like four if there's like small seventh graders. They like they came up with all the norms themselves. <laughs> Um, and I think we think that the overarching theme of our of our space change is collaboration. And the, yeah, the biggest thing we've noticed is the kids' level of comfort in the mm -hmm. room. Comfort has made a significant change um, in the way they collaborate with each other. Um, we so you know that the kids feel differently in your space when you walk into the room and they're like sitting at your desk. Um, <laughs> And that is like a daily occurrence for us. Like, I, you know, it'll be like study hall, or we'll be kind of roving around, and they'll just be like a kid at either, you know, like the main teacher desk or like the side desk, which Laura and I kind of like share. Um, and they'll just like set themselves up there at their computers and like be working away. They also, um, as they're working on their writing, something we do a lot of, they definitely, it's become a, a convention for them to use the writable services. Um, on their own. It's not actually always integrated into our lesson plans. It's more like, okay, we're going to be working with you on your writing. We're at this stage in the essay writing process. And they will work on the spaces, whether it be the back wall or the tables, um, as their own tool that they've become like fluent in using, which has been a cool, a cool manifestation of the collaborative element in the room. Um, so, yeah, this is going by class. Do you want to talk about classroom management? Oh, yeah. So I think um, one concern that I think a lot of teachers have when they hear about these uh, these flexible spaces and the fact that like we give students so much choice is, well, what if I'm like a really strict stickler teacher and I'm all about classroom management and I really like kids to focus? And I think that having these spaces, though like you can give the kids a lot of freedom, it's also a really good classroom management tool. 
um, it's a really it's really easy to uh, if a kid is having trouble focusing on writing to kind of move a desk into the corner and put a rolling whiteboard in front so that kid has his or her own space to write in and then stops being distracted. It's also easy to check for engagement and understanding. Um, so you, if you have kids working in small groups, they all have different colors of whiteboard markers. So you can see when you're coming around the room who's contributing to the brainstorming. Um, whether if, it, if all the writing is red and there's you know a kid with a red pen, you know that the that maybe like it's time to encourage the other kid to participate. Um, and it's also easy to say you can when you can see um, a kid's work and when they can see each other's work. Um, there's much more pressure to kind of, I guess, but it's good pressure to be engaged and be participating and be contributing to the space and like making your mark literally on um, the tables or the wall. Um, and also it's good to see, when I start to see, I always say like if I see a drawing of a dog, it's time to move on in the lesson. You can check for engagement really easily. If you see the kids starting to doodle or like write on each other's desks, like you're weird, no you're weird, it's like it's time to like move to the next <laughs> the next thing or like change what you're saying because they're not, they're either not getting it or they're, they've got it and they're ready to go. Um, so. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's our space, we like it. Awesome. Cool. So if you have questions, feel free to either tweet at them. We are at Hillbrook School. It's a really you know, creative name, I think. Or uh, you can just use a Q&A feature inside of Google+. So I see we have a few. Uh, I figure we can just go and order this one. It's from Nicholas Cole Farrell. Hello, Nicholas. Hi. I'm looking at him as though he's here. You're not here, but you're, you're on the Internet. General question for all, what's been the biggest challenge in transitioning to your specific agile learning environment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me, this is Josiane, I think for me the biggest challenge was um, trying to, I think I was thinking I had to really make my curriculum every, every lesson revolve around using the space, um, using my whiteboard tables, using the back, my back wall, and what I realized is I didn't have to. I could just take baby steps, and I, you know, I was comfortable with that, um, and didn't took that pressure off myself. But I think it was more the pressure that I put on myself. It was never put on me by anyone else more than myself. That now that I have this space, oh, now I've got to do so much with it, and every lesson has to involve it, and that was just way too much. So take that off and just take the baby steps, and every couple of lessons maybe incorporate it, so that would ease into the situation. So actually, um, our office, I don't know if we call it reimagined, but um, it's definitely more collaborative. We don't have big desks. People are invited to, to come and you know take a look and, and work and hang out and do whatever. But the problem has actually been then when people are working in my room and I need to hop on a hangout or a phone call, where do I go? So now we're looking at you know other places around campus because um, I, I want my office to be more collaborative, but then what do you do after that? So it's been an interesting problem. It's also been an interesting transition to learn that it's not actually about how the teachers use this as a space, it's about the way the students use the space. So like you can write into, and we do this, we like write in certain activities, um, you know, like involving the space into the lesson plans. But the more interesting data that we can be kind of like collecting between us is the things that the kids are doing in the space that we then feed back into um, how we teach. Uh, because that's fully adapted to their needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in an interesting way, I find that by opening up the space so much, you give the students this permission to behave in ways in the classroom that they otherwise wouldn't feel that they can, but in a good way. And so you, like, you see these things, like you see the cat on the desk, you see them in my class stand up and start rolling, doing like the log challenge, trying to you know stand on the cylindrical desk face, or um, chair face sideways. And so it's like, it reveals these things about the students um, having these choices in the room that it's then challenging because they were already there, but now because you're faced with them, you, you have to, to work with them, like integrate that movement, integrate that, I want to work this way, I want to work this way, I want to work this way. And so by opening that up, it, it feels like you're doing the right thing, but it, it's more complicated, I mm -hmm. think, than just having them all be like, sit at your desk, be quiet. Anyone else? Any other thoughts? All right. So next question. Thank you, Nicholas, for that. From Jason Nicholson. How do teachers record 
and or archive information written on the whiteboard tables and walls from class to class. A feeling the internet is involved. Also a feeling that technology might be a part of that. So. so we have enough space that if we're going to do something where they're writing on the walls and they need to keep it for multiple days, we can have like different whiteboards for different groups or different classes on the walls, not on the tables. We need to erase those because they'll like put their white elbows in them and it just gets bad. Um, but often you'll see kids taking a picture of their work with their iPad, so and they can like drop those pictures into their notes. So sometimes they'll both like take their own notes on what's going on, and then they'll take a picture of what the teacher is writing on the board, um, and then like drop that into their notes, so they have like both of those things, and they're not just like parroting back writing exactly what we're writing. They're like taking their own notes too. Mm -hmm. so that's a good combo. I know that Evernote and Google Drive have. Um, What's it called? Identification of text, OCR, oh, yeah. text identification, so that you can actually um, take a picture of your whiteboard and then search for those words in the image, and it'll show up in your Google Drive result or in your Evernote result. Yeah. So the future is now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, I'll, I'll just weigh in as well uh, from an observation point of view. Uh, one of the ones, uh, so Stanford D School. Uh, also kind of works on the same uh, problem. How do you create in, uh, a creative environment where everyone can flare and generate a lot of uh, uh, material but be able to come back to it project after project and actually keep it for an entire uh, quarter if necessary. And what they had done is they had basically jerry-rigged uh, whiteboards into smaller kind of you know, half-sized whiteboards that uh, students could own and carry around for uh, you know a whole quarter and then you you stack them vertically so that they all take up a very small amount of space, and you pull them out, and there's hangers all over the walls where you can just hang it up and start again. You know, and so that's going to be that was the solution they had, and that's the solution that's very popular um, at the D school. Uh, it won't be right for everyone, but it's an interesting way of just kind of hacking your own solutions. And now, actually, I think I believe you can buy those, um, so you can just get you know, 40 whiteboards, uh, one for every student. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's awesome. Cool. All right. So next question is from Kate Lusson. Hello, Kate. Is there an interest in creating some sort of consortium or research group so we could research schools across the country, um, like the number of schools that have wiggle schools, could we actually compile that data? So I see Ilsa smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd love to collaborate um, in our research. We are trying to build that up. We have collaborations this year just within our own school across grades um, and recently we've been working with Stanford University um, outside of uh, one of their labs in the School of Ed to, to do some follow-up studies on our movement questions. Um, we do have a Google Plus community. Uh, you can find us on Google Plus under the title Reimagining Classrooms and we have um, quite a few members there who are from outside of our school, outside of um, even the US, teachers who um, can then share questions and we have not yet designed a study on that site, but that would be a place to find us and to find other people who would be interested in that kind of work. I think Edmodo, we have an Edmodo group. Do we still have that? Never mind. Yeah. No, uh, I put that question. link, by the way, to that Google Plus community inside the Google Plus event page. It'll also be linked on hillbrookcte.org. So it should be pretty easy to find. All right. Thanks, Kate, for that question. Michael. Michael Toe asks us, what part did technology integration play into the process of designing your agile learning spaces? Mm. Should I start that one off since sure. I know sure. technology? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we didn't talk too much about what uh, technology would be in the classrooms. It was mostly actually about furniture. Um, and as the, the director of technology, I thought I would be pushing technology. Actually, the furniture seemed um, to have such a significant impact that technology wasn't really the focus, even for you know, someone like me. Uh, but we are moving towards TVs and sometimes multiple displays. So like Elsa in um, the middle school science classroom, we actually have a couple different projectors. So depending on how the students and the focus is oriented, or if we want to have kind of directions on this part of the screen, and then student examples over on this part of the screen, you can either hardwire or airplay via Apple TVs um, connect with it. So. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of ways, even though now we don't look that much at technology or we haven't looked that much at technology in our redesigns in the past year, um, being a one-to-one -one iPad school and making that transition from having a desktop library where you go in and, and bring your class there, um, transitioning from that to being a one-to-one -one iPad school across the middle school and now increasingly in the lower grades as well has really enabled us to do a lot of the furniture changes that, that we have. Um, because it's allowed us to really get work done outside to say to the kids, you know, like, if you, you can work wherever you want because now you have a device that has all of the resources and, and abilities to, to really actually be doing good work wherever you go and set your space up. That's actually the interesting part for me is that, for me, the, the story I hear is that it, it came out of the computer lab going away when we had iPads. So, all right, what do we do with the space? Let's have the iLab. Oh, hey, this furniture actually is amazing. What if we did this elsewhere? So it, it sprang from this disruptive thing called the iPad. Have you guys heard of that? You know, the iPad? <laughs> the iPad. See, now I'm wondering if you have anything to add to this question from the other schools that you've been working with. How much of their changes are driven by technology? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, we, we've got some schools that are very technology forward and others that, and, and I guess to clarify too, I mean, we get fairly particular about this, but we talk about digital technology and analog technology. So, you know, there's furniture, there's technology, but it's, it's rapid and it's new, and we try to integrate building and furniture systems. Uh, but then digital tools, um, we're working with a, a school up here in the city, Alt School, some might know it. Um, you know, started by a former Googler who actually developed uh, a, a lot of the, the chat that we're using right now. Um, and they're very technology forward, and so they are not only integrating tools for teachers to be working with students in the environment, um, but they are, in it, they are using uh, sensors and data collection that's happening in real time to be able to uh, automate some of the validation of, you know, our, you know it, it would even start to pick up our students using, you know, the different colored markers that someone mentioned earlier. Uh, to tell who's actually engaging and identify that that student. So some of this is getting very interesting, being able to, to automate some of that so that a teacher can have a report at the end of the day to know who's engaged and who hasn't. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, and, and some of the other things are, are essential for them. You know, you get schools that are, you know, start to focus on smaller spaces, smaller environments, as opposed to larger square footages. Um, technology plays a definite role in figuring out how do you uh, become, uh, you know, have the same uh, abilities uh, to host different activities within a smaller space. Um, and so that's where it kind of blends both digital tools. So can you get, you know, a flat screen versus, you know, a giant TV? So then all of a sudden you gain, you know, four vertical space, uh, feet of space, you know, against a wall or something like that. Now you can do uh, more activities in the room. Uh, that also goes with analog uh, equipment you know, that allows you to flex and you know, saw move things around, change it so you can open up and have more uh, centered engagement and break off into small groups. Um, so we're seeing, uh, you know, both analog tools that are, are, are you know, technology forward and also digital tools, technology forward in different schools depending on the needs. Very cool. Thank you, Signa. And last question. This one's going to get your head scratching. How do you keep the couches and benches lice free? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you see what I do with that? <laughs> no, um, we do. Well, we have, yeah, we've never had a, a lice issue with the couch. Um, we do have a lot of space norms that the kids come up with themselves because they'll, at the beginning of the year, we kind of say, okay, we have all this space. This is what we have. What do you guys think the rules should be? And they themselves will say, well, I don't think pillows should go on the floor. And, like, I don't think that people should be able to put their feet on the couches. And they come up with all of those because they want the space to stay clean. They don't want to be, like, you know, putting a pillow on their head that, like, someone else stepped on. Um, so often, like, they will be the ones. And then if, if a kid is putting their feet up on the couch, another kid will be like, no, that's not the rule. Like, ew, that's gross. Like, put your feet down. So they kind of do their own policing of keeping, keeping the, with some exceptions, of keeping the couch, um, like, kind of like a clean place. We had an iPad screen shatter into the couch this week, but that was the worst thing that's happened. Yeah. But yeah, we haven't we haven't had a, a lice we haven't had a lice, a lice issue. issue. But we're also we have middle school, so I think lice is more prevalent generally with younger kids. But I don't know. I don't you'd have to check the lice it's statistics. It's a testable question. <laughs> yeah. So I, I do know we have 
Kay's doing some homework for us right now, <laughs> so I have a, a flurry of texts. Um, actually, the American Association of Pediatrics has uh, shown us that lice transfer on school furniture is very, very limited. Um, and actually, Joe just texted me also, and he's like, there really isn't lice on couches. Um, so I guess it's not that much of an issue. Um, it, yeah, it, it needs, I guess, human scalps mostly. Um, yeah, that. Yeah, we should put our heads together, except when there's lice. <laughs> That's another like really bad Susanna telling me that. One. So yeah, Joe saying lice pulling transfer from hair to hair. So I would I'd recommend looking at the American Association of Pediatrics if you actually care um, more about lice than what we covered. But it hasn't been too much of an issue thus far. Katie, thank you for that question. <laughs> so. And with that, yeah, we'll leave. <laughs> Our goal is to, to get their head scratching, but this is not what I had in mind. All right. Well, thank you, Signo and Hillbrook teachers, for your participation today. This has been a really great conversation. And thank you all for joining us for Hillbrook School's first Center for Teaching Excellence webinar. So like we said earlier, this webinar will be available at the same Google Plus link when we're done. Um, also at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com Hillbrook School, and also at hillbrookcte.org. So lots of places to find us. And if you like what you heard today and you want more, join us for future webinars. We, uh, you can keep track of our upcoming topics on the CTE website, hillbrookcte.org. So thank you for joining us.